Hi, this is Don Forsyth speaking to you of groups and group dynamics and specifically power and influence. The human species is a very social species and because of that we respond one to another. Uh, we develop bonds of attraction that link us with others. We can communicate with each other but also we can influence one another. In some cases that influence process is, is, is very mutual and equal. Um, one person, person A, influences B and B in response influences A. But in other circumstances the influence of A is much greater than the influence of B. Uh, a may, for example, ask B to engage in behaviors that B would rather resist and yet is unable to do because of the social situation. We've already talked about Milgram's experimental demonstration of the magnitude of power, uh, social power. And in that study, he arranged for individuals to be placed into a situation where they were following the leaders of a legitimate authority. And as a result, they engaged in a behavior that they would prefer to have avoided. Milgram's experiment is is mysterious in some respects. The, the source of the experimenter's power, his, his influence, is just not clear. It, it's invisible in, in some ways. And so we have to make that invisible visible by looking at the situation a bit more closely. We'll examine it in this presentation by focusing on the basis of power as described by French and Raven in their classic analysis. And we'll also talk about power tactics and compliance tactics that researchers have investigated. We'll then move on in a future presentation to the analysis of social status and the metamorphic effects of power. Thank you, as always, for joining me. French and Raven in the late 1950s developed their classic theoretical statement of the sources of social power. They identified five bases of power, reward power, coercive power, legitimate power, referent power, expert power, as Dr. Raven considered his, con continued his work on the analysis of power, he added informational power. The basic idea is that in groups and across a range of social settings, uh, individuals who can control these sources of power, these bases, are more influential than others. A simple idea, but, but a very compelling one. For example, if we apply it to the Milgram experiment, why did individuals comply with the orders to continue delivering painful electric shocks? Why didn't they instead respond to the pleas of the learner who asked to be released? The explanation is that the learner controlled very few bases of power in the situation, was no expert, had little information, wasn't really known to the participants, certainly wasn't a legitimate authority, and didn't control re rewards, and certainly couldn't punish uh, the, the subjects. The experimenter, on the other hand, uh, controlled to some degree uh, many of these bases of power. Reward power of the experiment was perhaps the weakest. Uh, the experiment made it clear that uh, compliance or the rewards that were given, participants were paid five dollars for participating in the study, but they received that, that compensation irrespective of whether or not they obeyed the experimenter's authority. So reward authority, at least in terms of money, reward power, was relatively low. Although social rewards were still potent in the situation, uh, in the uh, experimenter was a individual who perhaps the subjects wished to impress and therefore was a source of social rewards. Um, coercive power was a bit stronger. There, there was a threatening overtone to the experimental situation and in fact one of the prods said uh, you, you must continue. The experiment requires that you can continue. So there was a veiled threat in the situation that increased the experimenter's coercive power. Uh, the, there was even more a legitimate right for the experimenter to ask the participant to continue. Both the teacher and the learner had agreed to participate in the study. The experimenter was the legitimate authority, uh, so he could require obedience. Reference power was a, a probably lower in the Milgram experiment. The participants didn't really know the experimenter. They probably didn't like the experimenter very much. They didn't identify with the experimenter. They, they weren't uh, 
college students, for example, looking forward to becoming experimenters themselves um, and respect, although the place where the experiment, or experiment was working was, was high in terms of respect um, because it was a college campus and many of the participants um, hadn't completed college themselves and so they respected the experimenter. Expert power was quite high. Um, electric shocks were being delivered and many of the participants knew very little about the effects of electric shock and so they deferred to the expertise of the experimenter and also his informational power was quite high. The subjects didn't know much about the situation. So as, so as you can see, uh, Milgram's experiment built up the experimenter's basis of power. A second example might be uh, Jonestown um, and the degree of power that the Reverend Jones was able to, to establish within Jonestown, particularly when he isolated the group uh, from the United States and from other groups and broke up uh, family contacts of the individuals who were in Jonestown. Uh, Jones eventually became the source of all rewards. He did use coercive influence methods to a considerable degree. He was recognized as a legitimate religious authority. He, he was, had strong referent power. Uh, the, his followers uh, obeyed his request. They identified with him. They respected him. You know, they, can, they, they loved and accepted him as their religious guide. And he was also the expert, and he controlled virtually all information in the situation. So his power was quite high. But people can influence each other not only by rewarding, threatening, punishing, sanctioning, demonstrating their expertise as well, uh, but there's also a, a wide range of social tactics that people can use to get their way. So a, a list, for example, if you have the text available to you, would be on page 255. Table 8.2 8 is just a sample of the many power tactics people use to influence other people. It includes things such as bullying, collaborating, complaining, consulting, criticizing, demanding, discussing, disengaging, and I'm only up to the D's. So there are many ways that people can get their way. You can distinguish among these ways, these various tactics along a number of dimensions. Some are more direct, others are more indirect. So you can instruct, you can order, you can argue, or you can ingratiate your way into favor, or you can try to manipulate the emotions of, of others so they respond to you in a positive way. Some tactics, as Dr. Raven explains, are soft tactics, others are hard tactics. Um, so you can use hard tactics such as bully, threaten, uh, withhold economic rewards, or offer such rewards. Softer ones involve collaborating, cooperating with other people. Some rely on, on rationality to influence, some are less rational. Um, that includes evasion and fait accompli. Some involve a connection between you and the other person and a relatively mutual level of influence. Those are bilateral discussion and negotiation. Some are unilateral. It's when one individual influences the other individual. Another approach to the analysis of influence uh, comes from Bob Cialdini's work um, on influence where he discusses principles of compliance. Um, he has been studying compliance professionals uh, for many years and discovered that if you look to see how the tactics they use to influence people, you can see certain principles underlying those tactics. Here's an excerpt from one of his web pages where he has that delightful uh, whiteboard presentation of his theory, uh, where he focuses on persuasion and influence. Researchers have been studying the factors that influence us to say yes to the requests of others for over 60 years, and there can be no doubt that there's a science to how we are persuaded, and a lot of this science is surprising. When making a decision, it would be nice to think that people consider all the available information in order to guide their thinking, but the reality is very often different. In the increasingly overloaded lives we lead, more than ever, we need shortcuts or rules of thumb to guide our decision making. My own research has identified just six of these shortcuts as universals that guide human behavior. They are 
reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, liking, and consensus. Under so Dr. Cialdini's analysis identifies, uh, as, he's, as he explains, six different principles that, that can explain why one individual can be so influential and, and another individual may be far less influential. And those principles are reciprocity, consistency, social proof, um, liking, authority, and scarcity. Um, and for more information, I strongly recommend his, his excellent book on influence. Compliance tactics can also be, be seen in, in these situations and his principles that he identifies uh, explain why these particular compliance tactics are so effective. The foot in the door technique is when an individual who wishes to, to gain another person's agreement to some enterprise begins with a, a small request, which is very difficult to deny, and then they follow up with a much larger request. Uh, the typical example is the very, very often seen a case where a person just simply says, say, can you do me a favor? And the person says yes, and then they ask their favor. Another tactic might be the door-to-door -door salesman who knocks on the door and before asking for you to subscribe to a magazine or to make a purchase from them, uh, says uh, it sure is a hot day today. Would, would you mind getting me a glass of of water uh, and then after you agree to give them the glass of water you will be more likely to then uh, purchase whatever it is they're trying to sell. Uh, the door in the face technique reverses that. It's where you, you start your request by asking in for an extraordinary request that you know that the person will deny. So rather than ask your, your friend or neighbor or roommate if you can borrow a thousand uh, 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 you want to borrow ten dollars but instead you ask for a thousand dollars and they of course say no and so you follow that up the request well you won't give me a thousand dollars but would you give me ten dollars so that's known as the door in the face uh, technique behavioral commitment involves uh, making certain that you have people um, act in ways which which are consistent with your request before you're revealing any of the costs so you extract agreement um, and that's the classic example of would you do me a favor and a person says yes I will before you tell them how costly that favor might be. Uh, another example uh, popular among college professors is uh, asking a colleague if they will guest lecture for you and they often say well sure I'll guest lecture to you and then you reveal that the lecture occurs at 8 a.m. and so they've committed themselves to a time of a, of a lecture that they would prefer to avoid. Um, even something as compelling as brainwashing um, involves these kinds of compliance tactics. Uh, we often think of brainwashing as an extraordinary social process, um, almost mystical. How can we explain, for example, how Jim Jones could have his, convinced his followers to commit mass suicide? How can we explain how um, the, the Chinese during the Korean War were able to influence the POWs they held at that time to uh, renounce their, their, their belief in the democratic system and express more pro-communist views? And sometimes we think that extraordinary uh, methods were used to persuade them. Um, and even speak of mind control. Um, and brainwashing itself is a, is a strong sounding term as if somehow their brain was washed clean of their existing beliefs and replaced with others. But in fact, if the examination of these processes reveals that it's these relatively common social influence tactics. Uh, for example, uh, during the Korean War, the, the POWs were asked to engage in relatively simple behaviors, you know, just simply, for example, discussing communist ideologies, um, not agreeing with them, but just discussing them, perhaps listing a few of them. And if they did so, they were rewarded in some way. Uh, eventually, the just listing was not sufficient to earn the rewards. You had to speak aloud of these principles um, to yourself. 
but then eventually you'd have to speak out of these principles to others. Um, and so at that point, uh, you were making a public commitment to communist principles, and many of the individuals complied with this process. Uh, Edgar Schein, in his classic analysis of how this influence takes place, is it begins first by shaking confidence in one's initial beliefs, which he called unfreezing, changing those beliefs um, through these behavioral compliance processes, and then refreezing these new beliefs and setting them in place. It should be it should be admitted that the brainwashing strategies of the, the Korean War were, were actually not very successful. Uh, very few Americans uh, changed their, their political beliefs and adopted communism as their political outlook. Most did not. They were willing to express those beliefs when they were held in captivity, but when they were released, uh, they reverted quickly to their original beliefs. Another very negative form of social behavior, uh, bullying can be tied to these processes as well. Uh, bullies tend to use among their ta a variety of tactics, but in particular co coercive influence tactics. Uh, studies of men and women, young men, young women, uh, children, suggest that males tend to bully through physical intervention and through name-calling primarily, and females, on the other hand, they bully through more interpersonal processes such as excluding from the group. And it's very clear that the bullying is a, is a power process. It's where certain individuals who have authority and status within the group try to increase their status and their authority in the group uh, by belittling, bullying, uh, subjecting to psychological and social harm those who are less powerful. So in general, it's, it's a case of someone who is already powerful um, aggressing against a more defenseless, than defenseless target. Bullying is, of course, also a group-level process. It is sustained by the group and the, the group structures and almost always occurs within a, a hierarchical group. Which brings us to our next topic. We have discussed the Milgram experiment and his demonstration of obedience to authority. We've talked briefly about power processes. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is social status um, and how influence is ex exerted and enjoyed by individuals who are higher in the status hierarchy relative to those who are lower in the status hierarchy. Thank you, as always, for joining me.